Good morning, Canisius community. It's Andy DL, Vice President for Institutional Advancement at Canisius High School. Welcome to another installment of Conversations with Canisius, a Zoom series where we check in with our accomplished alums all over the United States. This morning, I am joined by Sean Pierce. Sean is an entrepreneur and owner of Familia Vicente Pierce, a winery in Argentina. Good morning, Sean. Hey, good morning, Andy. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for having, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, we, want, we just want to get a sense, you know, of all of the amazing things that you've been up to. I said, you know, in the introduction that you're an entrepreneur and that covers a lot of ground. Um, you know, I've had the advantage of talking to you a few times. Uh, and so I know a lot more about you than our uh, viewing public at home does, uh, but your story is incredible and it's vast. And so let's just jump right into it. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey, not only to Canisius, but more importantly, sort of afterwards, oh, where you've been, your career, your college, all the different entrepreneurial and uh, business pursuits that you've had and sort of take us up to speed of where you are today. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I will start with how I got there because actually I forgot um, this story comes up every once in a while, but I played a basketball tournament at Canisius in what is now the theater space, right? The the sure. Masonic uh, temple basically with the amazing ceiling. And I was so blown away by, you know, the building and alumni hall and really that gym that it was probably in seventh grade playing in a tournament that I decided I was gonna go to Canisius, even though I grew up in Hamburg and I would uh, be signing up for an early trip to, the, to, to Hamburg High School to catch the bus every morning uh, on my way to Canisius. But uh, well, it was definitely worth it and I'm glad I did it. But yeah, that's how I decided to go there. But yeah, since, Canisius, um, yeah, I mean, I'll just give you an overview. I mean, basically, I went to college at Wake Forest down in North Carolina for its beautiful architecture and lovely weather, really. Um, and also, it was, at the time, an incredibly affordable liberal arts college, um, you know, best value rated kind of place that allowed students to sort of take every class you can think of in the liberal arts for the first two years before declaring a major. So I thought that was also... Um, a really great uh, path to take to kind of leave things open, not have to decide as an 18 year old what I was going to study. Um, you know, from there, I started working in financial markets. My first job was actually in London. Uh, I would not have landed that job if it wasn't for a few internships during college, um, you know, speaking with alumni and, you know, getting a, getting a job in finance in New York City uh, after my sophomore year of college. But then through an alumni, I ended up working in London. Um, one of the other major things I did was sort of save up money, quit my job, and go traveling a couple times, um, including after that London job. It, it was awesome. My dad's actually from London. I got to visit my grandmother all the time, who lived just outside of London, uh, and it was an incredible experience. It was a great job. Um, you know, I could be dumb for having quit, but. After I got my first bonus, I resigned and I, you know, did a backpacking trip about a year uh, going to a different bunch of countries and then moved down to Atlanta where a bunch of friends from college were living to start looking for a job again and started working in kind of a financial markets uh, consulting at KPMG. Uh, that was derivatives and risk management, which is what I was involved in in my two internships and my first job. So that kind of set the path for the career of working in financial markets. Um, after that job, I did a graduate school degree. So that would be six years after I finished college, I went to grad school. Uh, I went to Columbia in New York and studied international affairs. That is a international economics and Latin American studies or kind of economics and politics two year master's degree. Um, and after that, I went back to trading. So, you know, I kind of had this wonderful academic training plus the business degree at Wake Forest and the economics at, at Wake Forest to go back into a job that you know I really thought was was really great and challenging and super interesting and surrounded by wonderful people so um, after graduate school I started you know that that job I worked until 2018 so 12 years at the same bank and I guess that kind of wraps up the whole financial markets career uh, before I went on to, um, you know, work on this wine project and kind of be involved in using my financial market skills to do investments, which I do now, um, you know, plus the wine business. The wine thing didn't just happen. Um, 
you know, I started a wine tasting club in college at Wake Forest with a professor. You know, I found one of my flyers actually about a year ago that was, I think it was $2 to get in to the wine tasting. Uh, I can't remember who actually bought the wine, but I think we probably had money from the school, um, maybe from the professor, I'm not sure. Uh, and then in London, I took a few wine tasting and food pairing classes. During my backpacking trips, I, I did journal about this wine business of importing wines from South Africa, which was a place I had a lot of exposure to uh, via travel and via the people I worked with in London. Um, and anyway, it kept going. I met my wife who's from Argentina and that's kind of uh, how the Argentina thing started happening. I had no money. I was in grad school when I, met, when I got married, um, but I did you know, put together the spreadsheet about land in Argentina and what agricultural land I could buy. Obviously thinking about vineyards is a huge wine making place. And years later, we moved to Chile as part of this financial markets job. And we're going to Mendoza, Argentina, her hometown, my wife's hometown every month, and finally bought this vineyard in 2011. The launch of the actual wine business, we started making wine in 2013, but the launch of the business here in the U.S., uh, we did after I set up an import company here to bring the wines here and I didn't get my New York state license until 2020 this year, June. So we're really kind of a six month old wine business in, uh, in the United States right now. Those two things seem distinctly different, but you know, maybe they're not. So like you talk a little bit about, um, how they, you know, being in the bank world and the finance world and the financial markets and then being, you know, trying to set up a winery. How, how are those things how, how are those uh, skills similar and how are they different? A good question. I'm not sure I have the answer to that one. <laughs> but, uh, in terms of the similar side, you know, if I had to think about similarities, I'm going to say that, um, you know, they're definitely both challenging. I think like maybe you can tie the real estate, like the land itself, you know, land, real estate, it, it generally seems like a good investment from an investment perspective, like owning land, you know, you're probably going to keep up with inflation, you can get some productive use out of the land. I mean, I, I think maybe that's, maybe that's a similarity, but it's, it certainly wasn't, you know, the primary motivation. Um, I mean, I think really the best common denominator must be just like a deep interest in the thing. Um, you know, this, this wine interest was a really long term interest. And we're talking about college, you know, 1996, seven, eight with this wine tasting club, you know, and really it wasn't till 13 years later that we actually bought the vineyard. And on the financial market side, I remember with a guy actually ended up going to Canisius High School with in grammar school, um, you know, we, we had like this stock trading club and we would go home from school probably in sixth or seventh grade and like watch CNBC and pick stocks. I mean, no money involved, uh, you know, it was probably on a sheet of paper, I can't remember. But, you know, having an interest in something I think is the biggest common denominator. Um, also, I did work, I mean, this isn't a reason for the wine thing, but I did work in emerging markets, basically this entire financial markets career. You know, my job in London was focusing on Eastern Europe, uh, the, the interest rate and foreign exchange markets of, of Eastern Europe and their convergence to the European Union. The job at Merrill Lynch and Bank of America after graduate school was Latin American emerging markets. I traded all of the countries, you know, that have developed markets in, in Latin America. And Argentina is an emerging market you know, they are terribly ranked in the global, you know, best places to do business list, you know, number 126, I think. <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, but seeing kind of emerging markets and how economies function much differently from the US uh, is definitely a common denominator between, you know, watching these countries and what happens to their markets versus, you know, trying to do business in Argentina. And there are definitely lessons learned in the financial market side that kind of make a lot of things that could be surprises sort of business as usual when you're actually working in, in the country. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about the time at Canisius and, and how that prepared you for your career, just you, both your past career and your current career. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm probably realizing more and more how it did prepare me as I see my kids being in school and what they're learning and how they learn. And I mean, one of the major things I would just say is, well, I'll, I'll name sort of three or four things. 
there's a challenge, right? There's a challenge in the work that you're doing there, the sports that you're playing there, uh, everything from whatever, your math class. I mean, I took two semesters of calculus at Canisius College when I was at Canisius High School. It was amazing that the school offered that opportunity. Um, you know, there's always a challenge available for you at Canisius. And, and if you want it, if you want to push forward and you want to be curious, uh, which, which I think is, w w is a great thing, then the, the opportunity is there. Um, relationships, so relationships with your professors, with uh, the, your, your students, with your teammates, with your you know, club uh, colleagues, that is an important thing that, well, one, you know, some of those relationships I, I still have to this day. I mean, my friends from my, my lunchroom table, you know, I still talk to all of them pretty much. Uh, Father Sansomino was the principal when I was at the school and, and now he's president of It's wonderful that he's back and you know I, I still talk with him. Um, so that kind of available challenge, relationship specifically, and then you know the whole philosophy about sort of pursuing excellence and being a person for others or being there to help others or think about others, think about your actions and how they affect others. I think that's you know that's something definitely my, my parents also instilled in me but Canisius really kind of cemented that as part of my personality I would say um, I think all these skills I use every day it, it doesn't matter if it's sitting in front of six computer screens in a bank or um, you know on the phone talking with the guy that we're putting together our 2020-21 season fertilization plan it, it doesn't matter um, you know math skills are definitely useful and it can just be you know the speed at which you can multiply something or whatever it is or conceptualize fractions or problems or in independent variables or whatever it is is very useful um i memorized a lot of spanish vocabulary and verb conjugations when i was in high school and i admittedly left there speaking none um <laughs> definitely terrible speaking spanish and I studied, I did Latin American studies in graduate school and I was the, actually the, the Institute of Latin American Studies student fellow. I got a scholarship um, in, and I worked in the Institute and I helped organize events with central bankers and presidents uh, around Latin America to come to New York and present. And I learned a lot of Spanish. It still wasn't amazing, but when I started my job at uh, the bank, I asked for a tutor. I had heard that that was a possibility. And I went twice a week for an hour each time for six months, just speaking, no writing, no vocab, no verb conjugations, but how was your day? It was good. What did you do today? You know, with a guy or a girl who was there um, at the Language Institute. And that was incredibly helpful. We lived in Chile. This is how I learned how to speak. But I was so prepared for having done spent through Spanish five at Canisius High School. I, I, I still knew all these words. It was amazing how it sticks. Um, so yeah, I use that every day. The relationships, the pursuing excellence and, um, you know, thinking about your actions um, is still every day. I mean, I'll give you a stupid example, but, you know, where I lived in New York City, um, the, the last place I lived was called Lafayette Avenue in Brooklyn. It's, um, it's in uh, Fort Greene is the neighborhood. Lafayette Avenue is, it's, it's a one way street, two lanes, two parking lanes on each side. And people all the time would double park on that street to drop off something, to pick up something, to whatever, wait for their takeout. I mean, whatever they were doing and completely ruin the day blocking traffic of dozens and dozens of people. I would never do that. I would never, ever, ever, ever do that. That is totally unacceptable in my book. I think that that awareness of your actions from Canisius, from my whole upbringing, you know, I think it's important, uh, you know, and, and maybe studying economics, you realize negative externalities of your own behavior. I mean, it's, it's a concept that, um, you know, you also become aware of through, through studying that, you know, that subject. But, um, you know, think about how your actions affect others. I mean, that's just a really basic example, but um, that's what I have for you. Well, that's it. It's a great segue because, you know, and 
Tanisha is obviously isn't just academics preparation. There is a spiritual yeah. component to it. Right. Sort of that Ignatian formation that we all go through as long as of the school. Um, do you find that you you use sort of that Ignatian formation? Or how do you experience that, not only in your sort of journey, but in your life today? And you answered some about that, about, you know, just being aware of others and what they need. But is there, is there, could you expand upon that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so the Ignatian formation training, I have actually really fresh in my head because of the, my, my year teaching at Canisius. So I taught at the high school 2018-19, uh, full-time Spanish, um, you know, five class, five, five live shows a day, five days a week to a tough studio audience is how I call it. Um, but uh, as part of that experience, which is a great experience, it was a wonderful time. Uh, I really liked it. There was this Ignatian formation training that, um, that I really enjoyed. I didn't really know what to expect, but, you know, led by Paul Cumbo, it was this moment of almost, you know, deep relaxation because we had a small homework assignment, read this one page from a book, a passage, whatever it was. Um, some of it was from the uh, Jesuit Guide to Everything, I think it's called, something like that, there's a book. Um, but anyway, it was something really, really short and seemingly simple that we read then we came to discuss it and it was incredible that something that you that you could form a, a view on quickly and say this is what i believe move on um was probably not that informed if you sit down to talk about something in detail so i mean i'm gonna i guess i'm trying to provide an example but the idea is basically that you know you think you see this behavior from a student for example one of your students and this is your conclusion. Well, did you think of this? 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 How do you take all this, all these potential influences in this student's life uh, to determine why they're behaving this way? And how can you help really is the, the moral of the story. I mean, the, the, the part in the end is how do we understand this behavior to make this student a better person? And that is, you know, this, this uh, development of the individual that Kanisha's focuses on that, that really makes it an amazing place. Seeing behind the curtain as a teacher made me realize why the school did so well for me and why I loved it so much and, and why it does so well for so many other people. Um, so that was an interesting, that, that was a great part of this Ignatian formation training. When I think about the high school side of it, you know, I don't, I don't feel like it was so formal as our, you know, monthly one hour session or, or roughly that uh, as a teacher, it was more obviously the retreats. And I know the retreat program is more developed now than it was when I was there, but you know, that is a wonderful time to take that moment away to think about family, friends, your relationships with these people, your relationship with God, the, you know, the time to think about, how you are in this world is is a wonderful thing to go through and i think the the retreats are wonderful but also you know we did things like read a complicated text in english class in high school it could have been oedipus rex right this is this is a book that you can spend a 45 minute class period talking about a page um, that is extremely similar to this thoughtful process we took as part of our nation formation training as a teacher so um in terms of like <clears throat> modern day how am i kind of still doing that well you know i think you realize when you're taking time away to, to think of something because you've experienced that feeling before i think that's just re recognizing that is is really a great step take a deep breath think about your place in the world um, but also uh, realizing that there is more than one perspective on many, many, many things and, and that it's, it's really important to kind of behave the way or, or show via your actions, you know, your values and, you know, what, what makes you up as a person and that, you know, words can be powerful. Um, but uh, the actions are really the important part. And I think kind of 
the only way to, to judge people. All right. So if, if you were uh, looking back, we had, uh, ideally a lot of young alums, current students are going to be seeing these videos that we're doing. What's some advice that you would give to a student in high school today or somebody who's just out of, out of school, either they're in college or they're starting their business, um, their business experience out in the real world? What would you get? What, what advice would you give to young people today that you've learned? I mean, I think one of the most cherished experiences of my life probably has been the ability to travel to go places and you know I, I made it happen myself by sort of making it a priority um you know I, my first job i got that you know tiny kind of second year bonus in london and took off um you know my intention was spending basically the whole thing over the course of a year like how much travel can i get out of this you know 15 grand or whatever it was and do i have enough left over to like pay a friend rent and or or go home and start looking for a job and how long it's going to take me to find that job so that literally i end up with zero dollars at the end of it i mean that, that's kind of how i prioritized uh traveling and i think you know i've been to a lot of countries and seen a lot of places and been in you know weird and interesting and beautiful and whatever all and sad experiences um, that I think both consciously sometimes but surely subconsciously uh, affect the way I see things and the way I think and you know and will probably be there for the rest of my life I think that's advice about you know using your vacations wisely maybe trying to take some time off um, I don't know if parents are going to see this, but in England, you know, after high school, most kids take, well, not most kids, but, you know, kids, certainly if their parents can figure out a way to help them or they, the kids can find a job, they take a year off before they go to college and travel. I mean, that's, that's great. I didn't do that. So I can't, I can't say it's, it, it would have helped, but having traveled literally for years, um, I, I see the benefit in it. And maybe at that age, it's, more beneficial, maybe it's less beneficial, maybe it's too young. But anyway, the point is to make it happen, even if it's your your vacation from a job, you know, think about what you can squeeze in, what you can go see that you haven't seen before. It it will probably open your mind in a way that you wouldn't expect. And it's it's very uh useful thing in life. So I guess that would be one piece of advice. The other main thing is just about um, you know, take your interest or your curiosity or your passion, whatever whatever it is and follow it and, and let it guide you and you know trust in that thing you will probably find that some of those passions or interests are you know not rewarded or not something you actually end up being interested in or you you think it was something else um but the pursuit of them with commitment you know in time and literally years uh, will reward you and you will be happier and more successful as a result. So I think, you know, pursuing your interests, curiosities, passions is is definitely the other big one. Um, so I I kind of thought of a few examples to, to make the point about following that interest won't necessarily wind up how you expect, um, but that it's good. So, you know, I since the fifth grade wanted to be an architect um i'm still incredibly interested in it and i've sort of pursued it in other ways but you know for career day at st peter and paul in hamburg you know i, I dressed like an architect whatever that means i definitely had um like a, a v sweater with buttons on it that my mom probably bought for me that i would never wear otherwise i don't know but that that's what i wore and i had some blueprints from an office that uh, where my dad worked that they were building he brought home these blueprints i took to school my dad actually presented that day so it was a memorable day. Um, but yeah, as I went to high school and still had this interest, I, I did two things. One, you know, I, I tried to find someone to help me build a portfolio to apply to school. I wanted to go to the Cooper Union in New York City. It's free if you get in. I mean, it seemed awesome, amazing school for architecture. And, you know, I just, I just didn't get my portfolio together. I didn't really find anyone that knew enough about the process and the application and the requirements and, and what this was to kind of help me along. And I, I regret it a little bit in that 
in retrospect, I probably didn't need someone else. I just needed to, you know, really focus and spend more time on it. I mean, you could not look these things up on the internet, right? I mean, you, you, you sent a letter or made a phone call to the school and you asked them for their information. I mean, it was, it was in technology terms hundreds of years ago. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I failed on that one, but um, you know, I, I kind of don't regret it because I have been pursuing this for a very long time anyway, um, you know, from whatever house doodles uh, to this day to actual projects that I've done. Um, I, for 10 years straight, have been reading Architectural Record, which is the monthly magazine of the American Institute of Architects. I've been reading that magazine for 10 years straight, cover to cover, pretty much, um, without fail. And uh, and I've actually been heavily involved in the design of actually this house we're in now um, and, uh, and then in another house and then in renovation projects and, you know, 3D drawings of, of kitchen remodels that I've done and things like that. So I, I've been heavily involved and as a hobby and, uh, and working on two other projects actually that, you know, might happen in the next year uh, where, where I'm involved in the design and the planning and, and it's kind of like I had another career which allowed me to make money to focus on architecture rather than being an architect in practice. Um, you know, my mom says God works in mysterious ways. That's a, a favorite saying of her. So, you know, I think that's true. Um, so that's an example of, of literally being interested in something for 30 something years uh, and actually not making a career out of it. Um, but it being there all the time and, and you're developing and maturing in that interest forever. Um, I think I have another example or two. What's that? I was just going to say one of the, one of my you know, last questions before we signed off was just going to be, I know you're an idea guy. You have, you're always working on something. And I just wanted to, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have this winery project right now. What are any other projects that you wanted to talk about before, you know, we, we, uh, move along. Um, yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, I guess quickly about the wine thing itself. I mean, this is this is also another long term thing that you guys have kind of heard the seeds of how it all happened. Um, but really, we're just getting going. So I spend a lot of time on that. Um, everything from working like work at the farm. I mean, I go there and I work. I go pretty much every day to the farm itself when I'm in Argentina, which is non-COVID sort of two and a half months a year probably. Um, but I also, you know, I'm remotely working on with the winemaker uh, based in Argentina with the viticulturalist, the person that we, you know, we put together pruning and fertilization and, um, you know, improvement uh, ideas at the farm, uh, replanting if, if needed, things like that. Uh, and then on the wine side, I do all the import, all the logistics and also basically all the sales and I, I work with uh try distributing here in buffalo um you know matt Vuklik from my class in canisius high school and my lunch table in canisius high school we're working you know together on that we've been talking about it for a long time and actually making it happen now um so that's taking up a lot of time i visit all the stores and the restaurants and you know i go to a farmer's market uh chandler street market uh to to pour not during orange covid but pour samples and talk to people about the wine and kind of get the word out and get them on our mailing list and following us on Instagram and Facebook. That takes a lot of time, but um, it's great and it's getting going and it's growing quickly. So, so that's, that's awesome. But other things um, I do, I, I'm really involved in financial markets still. I mean, I, I trade uh, equity options mostly uh, very actively and I'm working with a friend actually from a, three friends from uh, where I worked in the bank from the trading desk uh, at different times during my time at Merrill Lynch and Bank of America on um, potentially automating my process for this options investing strategy. So, I mean, stay tuned. It could be a year plus uh, for sure, but I, I would like to um, sort of spend less time on that investment thing using programming and big data sets to uh, kind of guide uh, how that works. And then on the, you know, this architecture side we talked about, uh, I, I, I bought this old house in the first ward that 
was falling apart. I knocked down. I have a lot. I've been talking to an architect uh, working on uh, the basics of a design to build uh, basically four unit. I mean, they're condos basically, <clears throat> but something really cool um, design wise that, you know, maybe we'll start next year or the year after. And then, you know, a couple other odd projects, but yeah, that's the, uh, I resigned from Bank of America in 2018 um, to not work Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. plus a subway commute. Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, during that time, my kids were born and, you know, I made it to their school maybe twice a semester. And now I'm pretty much there for pick up and drop off every day. So twice a day uh, involved in all the events and everything. Um, <clears throat> so I, I decided to leave uh, an, an awesome job surrounded by super intelligent people that was, it was really satisfying, but it was all or nothing. And I saw people get sort of sucked into that, that life for their entire lives and really putting work before anything else. So I just plain stepped out and resigned. And um, so, yeah, uh, since then, I've really been focusing on putting these things together. I think just talking to people and being involved and following your interests means it's really unpredictable actually what happens next but i always have like you know a few of these balls in the air so uh but yeah that's what i'm working on now well clearly you're very busy we really appreciate you giving us time today but thanks very much it's been great uh, it was great to hear sort of your journey uh and, and your paths you've taken since you you know you left Mesha's high school and i look forward to staying in touch and uh, hopefully doing this again soon awesome thanks andy no thanks for having me it was uh great to spend some time with you sharing a story and uh, stay in touch great to connect All right thanks Sean. thank you